today I'm going to be asking a few questions of Marius Roll. Marius, can you tell us a little about how you developed your approach to voice hearing? Yes, I think it started with uh, a Dutch patient. I am a social psychiatrist, and that means, in fact, a psychiatrist specialized in the relationship of mental health problems with the context in which people live. And so she was not very happy with the way I helped her with her problem of hearing voices because I only ask questions around the diagnostic issue to see if it's a real hallucination, auditory hallucination. I was thinking in that term at that time, actually. Because, and then she said, yes, but that doesn't help me with my voices. I mean, that might help you with your diagnosis, but I am not much help. So I, but I didn't know much about voices, like we are not trained in psychiatry not to talk about voices. So then you don't learn anything about them. So I then thought, now perhaps, now it took some time before I really thought I'd go into this question. But then she said, you believe in, you believe in God, or I think you believe in God, because I come from a Roman Catholic family. But you don't believe in my voices. And then I said, yeah, I must be, they are a little right because I doubt if it's real. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I said, but we can check perhaps that. Um, will, you, um, will you talk with another person who also hears voices? So then I get a better idea what you experience because honestly told, I don't know much about it. And so I put them together, asked them to talk about their voices, and I sat just silently listening. And that was impressive, how they knew all kinds of strange things. It was like being uh, dressed on a naked beach or naked in a dress beach. But I mean, it was very total different things you never heard. It was a revelation. To it was hear. a revelation. Yeah. And but anyhow, they could tell very well what they experienced. There was not any doubt with them, and it was also the one understood the other five words. So from there, we go on and, start and said, oh, yeah, that is a good idea. Then anyhow, I know there is a reality basis. They really have to tell something. And then they came back after a while because I exercised, I tried it with others and said, yeah, this is nice to talk about the voices, but we can't go better with them. And that's where Sandra thought about why not try, uh, now try and get on a television show. Then we can ask people in their own homes if there might be somebody who knows how to cope with voices. Because if it's a phenomenon that is so clearly experienced, there must also be one who knows how to cope with it. And we did that, and then we got a lot of people who reacted, 700 in fact, so we couldn't meet them, but then we sent out a, a how do you call that, an uh, enquête, and we asked questions about their voice hearing, about how many voices, simple questions. And then it became clear that you also get people who, who hear voices but never heard the patient, who can very well cope with them. And that started our interest, because hey, then it's something totally different. That means also when we got to study and saw also new developments in the epidemiological uh, 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 population research that hearing voices itself is not seldom, 4% of the population here. So in itself, it's not a, a, a pathological phenomenon, it's not a symptom. And as a psychiatrist, you wouldn't see those people normally. You never would see those no. people because they don't, they don't need you, no. they don't come. And they know we don't know anything about it. So uh, <laughs> they are wise. They know that you get medication, which is not the right way to learn to cope with it. Okay, well, we'll come on to, yeah. well, to that in a moment, which uh, that will be very interesting, I'm sure. What evidence is there to show that uh, a non-medical approach works? No, I think that is why this book is quite important, Living with Voices, and those we knew, but we have assembled 
50 persons we have interviewed and a number of them have written their own stories, so the one writes better than the other. So then when they didn't get a real clear story, we interviewed them. And by the network of voices that are in the movement, where there are many groups, you know quite a lot of people, so you know who have recovered. And we assembled 50, which is already quite a lot of work, because 50 coming from England, Holland, uh, Germany, Norway, everywhere, because we also found it important that it's not something Dutch, it's not something English, it's worldwide, it's the same experience everywhere. And they told their stories, and from those stories, it becomes clear that it's quite well possible to recover, but outside psychiatry, and that is a pity, because it would be easy for psychiatry to open a little bit, open, uh, more open to this problem, and they would help people much better than now. Right. And it, it is heavily stigmatized in Northern Europe, voice hearing in Northern Europe. And there are some countries in, the, in around the, the world where it's not so heavily stigmatized. And you think that might be the, the, the stigma? Yeah, that, that is one something. of the differences, but I must say, I think we as Westerners only listen to our own culture. So keep it in your culture, and there are enough people who can cope with their voices. Yes because only one-third of them have any problem or ask for help, and two-thirds of them have no, no problem and are even positively influenced and helped by their voices. Because voices express emotions, and what psychiatry has done is making it a symptom of an illness, which was understandable when you didn't know and were not used to ask for the people's own experience. And then it's very strange in the beginning, but after a while you get more information and then it shows that hearing voices is a quite clear, uh, giving you information about the person's life history and what has happened. So the age of the voices, for instance, to make it concrete, might be the age of the voice here, when he was traumatized. Or the age of the voice might be the age of somebody involved in the trauma. And so what they tell about, what they tell are often memories from the traumatic experience. And the triggers are the emotions they have difficulty with. Somebody who can't cope with aggression gets as a trigger for his voices when he comes in an aggressive surrounding. Or when he's not able to express aggression, he will then, when he feels ex uh, uh, aggression, then the voices will come instead. Because voices express conflicting emotions. And in psychiatry, it's much the accent on the explanation, the, the thinking part. But that's not important at all. And how would you ever get a relationship with a patient if you don't accept what he is experiencing? We also accept depression, we also accept anxiety, we don't deny that. So it would be only much nicer and much interesting more for a psychiatrist to know how to talk and how to analyze the relationship between the characteristics of the voices at one side and the disordered emotions and what has happened to the person at the other side. So it becomes really an interesting profession. While only prescribing medication is not of that same interest. It's quite simple and yeah. Sure. Especially if the medication, the aim of the medication most of the time is to actually suppress it. Yeah, that the is why the opposite. You're right, it's the opposite and it's also handicapping the person because he has to learn to cope with his difficult emotions. And the only thing medication really does is to suppress emotions. So the goal of treating, or we can't treat this human variation, but learn to cope, you could compare with homosexuality. In the sure. 50s, we tried also to change homosexuals with heteros. And we had all research about how do you become a homosexual. Now we finished with that kind of thing because the homosexuals themselves have emancipated and nobody is so much interested how to become homosexual but 
just how to cope with it and how to relate with other homosexuals, and that would be for the future of voice hearing, I hope, that they learn to relate to their voices like two-thirds of them can. So really what you're saying is that psychiatry and the medical profession have medicalized something that is simply an aspect of human variation. It's simply a, a to do with human diversity, the diversity of experience, yeah. just as sexuality is diverse. Yeah. Which is it's very It's not different. always simple like left-handedness, but it is more complicated mm -hmm. because it's, you have to say they express emotions, and in our society, emotions are not the thing people, most people are a little bit afraid of expressing emotions, so they learn in their development to act. <coughs> to express their emotions in a balanced way. And that is something also voiceers who have had problems in their life have to learn. So, if I could ask you one final question, it sounds as though the first piece of advice you would give to people who hear voices and have distressing experiences might be to express themselves. Yeah. Is there any other advice that you would give people that have distressing voices? No, I would say that is the main issue, to express themselves, because not expressing yourself makes it also worth but what all what you keep in your mind and have no way out for because you are ashamed or feel guilty or yeah, think everybody uh, thinks you are crazy. So that is uh, an inhibition of expressing, and as soon an inhibition is so totally, then you get, it also stimulates the voice, because you can't get all your emotions by suppressing them. You can only shift them to the outer world and hear voices. And the voices are telling you about yourself. That's why each voice has different, each person has different voices. Now, I know I just said that would be my last question, but I've thought of another one. Yeah. And that is, you, a moment ago, you drew a parallel between um, having homosexuality as a diagnostic category years ago and voice hearing as a diagnostic category now. And I'm wondering whether you see the Hearing Voices movement as a similar, similar political movement almost to gay liberation where change will come from the experiences of voice hearers yeah. rather than the pronouncements and theory of psychiatrists. Yeah, that is in emancipation. It's the group themselves that makes the change, not other people. Other people might support or inhibit, inhibit but it's not them who emancipate. Emancipation is the group itself. And that's why the Young Voices movement is stimulating the people to come forward with their hearing voices. But that is easier when they have recovered naturally yeah. than when they are still full of anxiety which are the anxieties they had for the traumatic situation. Mm -hmm. So it will be taking some more time, but I think hearing voices is not a phenomenon that should be in psychiatry, it is a phenomenon of developing one's own emotions and one's own life. You take back your own power to live your own life. Thank you, that's a really positive place to finish. Thank you very much, Andrew.